If you still remember, if we read around maybe 10 to 11 or 12 verses last Sunday, it's more about imperatives, more of commands. Do this and do that. Pray, rejoice, give thanks, do not quench the spirit, live in peace, encourage one another. It's all about commands. It's all about us doing the work through the power of the spirit. It's more of God's asking us to do something through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now there is a sudden change of tone from the letter. The last verse, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it tells us that it's about rejecting what is evil. Again, it's an imperative. It is a command. Reject the evil. And now we are going to follow it up with the first word of this section in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. The tone has changed. It is about the work of God. Not our work, but primarily God will work. And I would like to entitle the message, God is at work in you. God is at work in you. God is at work in you. God is at work in you, my dear sister. God is at work in you, my brother. God is at work in you. And I'd like to start right away there from verse 23. See, may God himself, it is God who's going to work. May God himself, it is the prayer of Paul for the Thessalonians. Again, as a way of review, I would like to give you a little background of this. Paul established the church in Thessalonians, in Thessalonica. He was there preaching the gospel only for three weeks. And because of persecution and trouble, they needed, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they needed to escape so that they won't be harmed. So they went to Greece. And what happened, he, uh, they went to Berea, they went to, to Corinth, and this is where Paul wrote this letter, Thessalonians, from the Corinth for the church in Thessalonica. And now here, May God himself, after all saying these things, now what? May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. After, after, after we all learned together for the past three months about this church in Thessalonica, they were driven by their faith, their hope, and love. They were persecuted, but they continued to thrive. They learned about the last, the last days of our lives. They learned about the rapture. They, we've learned together about the day of the Lord. About YOLO, you only live once. Now that we are already in the last days, now we can actually... Live our lives to the fullest and learn to live wisely. And last week we learned that we should grow with the church. Now what, Pastor June? May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Here, remember that God is at work. Remember that God is doing something in your life. Remember that you are going through the process. Because God is at work. You are going through the process. Pastor June, is that true? Am I really going through the process? Yes. Again, let's take this word, sanctify. It's quite a big word. Maybe if you're new, or maybe you're just one year, two years, maybe this word sanctify is new to you. But sanctify simply means to separate. If I'm going to sanctify this remote, I am going to separate it only for the use of my sermon or preaching every Sunday. No one could use this because I'm going to sanctify it only for my preaching every Sunday. But no, I'm not sanctifying this. What I mean just that's the, the meaning. We have to separate it for special use. 
That's the meaning of sanctification. And people are being sanctified by God for a special use. We are being separated from the world, from the sin, not necessarily trying to corral you or, or to imprison you. Not that, that's, not, that's not what I'm telling you. But I'm saying we are being separated for a special use. In order for you to be used by God, you have to be holy. That's why you are going to be separated, separated from the world so that you will be holy, that you could be used by God for a special purpose to reflect his character, his image, to bless and love other people. That's how God wants us to fulfill the purpose in our lives. So we are being sanctified. And we are sanctified because of the blood of Jesus. When we receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are sanctified. We are separated already from the world. I'm not saying you no longer go to the world. You no longer go to your friends. I'm not saying that you, are, you don't go to, to marketplaces or go to school or go to your workplace or to, to what have you because you're already separated. You know what I'm trying to say? Positionally, you are separated from the world, not trying not. Not to try to engage or imitate the, what the world does. But we are already separated. We are already cleansed. We are already saved. We are already holy. Because we are separated by the blood of Jesus from sins. It means to say you are saved. But why the word tells us that you are, sanct you are being sanctified through and through. Meaning this is, all, it is an ongoing thing. Because we still live in this world. We still commit sins. It doesn't mean that you're already sanctified, that you're already Christian, that you're already justified. It doesn't mean that you're no longer sin. We all still sin. Every day of our lives, we commit sins. That's why we need to be sanctified through and through. Okay. For you to be, to be clear with this. Sanctification, you are positionally sanctified, you are already holy, you are separated, okay? But because we are still here on earth, God needs us to be sanctified daily. Why? Because we commit sins. And that's what you call progressive sanctification, continuously, okay? The first thing, the first one is you are sanctified because you are saved already, you are separated, because you're still, but you're still here on earth. You still commit sins. And God will continue to sanctify you through and through. You're going through the process. Until you, you would become fully sanctified when Jesus Christ comes. Do you, you see that? The past and present and future. We're already done with past with our sins. We're already positionally sanctified. But we are still here on earth because we are still sinning. We need to be sanctified continuously, progressive, ongoing. And because we, God wants us to be fully sanctified, free from the presence of sins. And now we are already in the presence of God. That's why you are going through the process. Now I know. It's so, it's, it's so uh, that, that concept or that subject or that topic is so big to you. Now, let's, let, me, let me put it this way. The main purpose of God in your life is not to have a comfortable life. It's not for you to have a luxurious life. It's not for you to have a free or a, a life without trouble or trials in life. That's not the purpose or the aim or the goal of God in our lives. The main purpose of our God in our, for, to, for our lives is to have a life that is to be more and more like Christ. That's the ultimate purpose of God in our life. So those things that we are experiencing right now, those are just ways of God by his, sanctifying us. So hear me with this. Pastor June, I'm going through some trials, persecution, or, or trouble. I have pain in life. Let me tell you. You're going through the process. 
why you, why you need to go through that? In order for you to, be, to become more and more like Christ. Because that's the ultimate goal of God in our lives. To be more and more like Christ. So the suffering, the pain, the sickness that you are going through right now. You might go through those things. But those things could lead you to be more and more like Christ one day. You are, you are, you are, you are more loving than you used to be a year ago. You are more teachable. You are more faithful. You are more, you serve God more than you used to be. Because you are, God is changing you from glory to another glory. You are going through the process. You might say, I serve God. I offered my offerings to God. I come to church regularly. I serve him in the band, the media, or pork parking marshal. Why do I need, or why do I have to go through these things? Yes. Because we are living in this hostile world. We are living in this world that, is not, that opposes Christianity. That's why there are things that are not right with our lives. Because this, these are the result of the sin of the world. That's why we experience sufferings. We experience flood. We experience calamity. We experience wars. Why? Because of the sin of the world. But God can use those things in order for us to be more like Christ. Do you see what I, what do, you, do you understand what I'm saying here? All these things that we are experiencing, right? God can use that in order for you to be more and more like Christ. You might say, so Christianity is a boring thing. It's so boring. It's just pain, struggle in order for us to be more like Christ. I won't blame you for thinking that way. Oh, I, I lose my job. I lose my my friendship, people abandoned me. I was diagnosed with the sickness. Is that God wants just for me to be more like Christ? You know what? God is omniscient. He knows everything. If God knows by giving you a brand new house and lot, if he knew that it would make you more like Christ, God will give you that. If God knows that by giving you a pay rise, promotion will help you to become more and more like Christ, God will give you that. God is not a mean or tyrannical God. He knows everything. He knows what's best. He knows what's good for you. And that will bring him glory. Don't think that buying a, a, a brand new car is right away, uh, it's a luxury thing. It's a, it's a want. It's not a need. No, it's not. I thought at first, buying a brand new car, I thought, oh, Lord, if I'm going to buy, is this a luxury? Is this something, Lord, that is a want and not a need? But at the end of the day, do you know what? I saw it as a need for me. Why? It kept me sane. It gives me joy traveling me with my wife. Long drive. You know, we, my wife, my family, they know that I love driving. But you know what? Don't limit God. If God knows that by giving you a grand holiday could make you more and more like Christ, he would. Yeah. That's why don't be afraid to ask for big things. Don't, uh, don't be afraid to ask for five-bedroom house. Who knows? It's a need, not a luxury. Only God knows. I 
God wants you to be a testimony. God wants you to be an example and a model to others. How can you be a model to others if you are sickly? If you are, if you are, if you are uh, in, always in trouble, always in need. And God wants you to flourish in order for you to be a good testimony to others. Would you believe my prayers if you see your pastor living in poverty? Pastor, you're a pastor. You're praying for our for us daily. But why you live in poverty? Why you're so poor? But I'm not saying that I know that many pastors in the church in the Philippines they are living in poverty. I'm just saying that we have we have different different uh, uh, cases and scenarios. But I'm telling you, but God wants His children to be a testimony in all part in all areas of our lives. Right? Remember that you're going through the process. Pastor June, I lost my job. Pastor June, I lost my relationship. Pastor June, I'm sick. Remember, you're going through the process. God is doing something in your life. God knows that he is going, he, he's sanctifying you to be more and more like Christ. That's his ultimate purpose. Yes, you might you may be sick right now. You, un, you don't understand why you're sick. You don't understand why you lose your job. But God is going, is doing something. You're going through the process in order for you to become more and more like Christ. God wants you to be more like Christ. That's his ultimate purpose. Your comfort, that's just secondary. But if God wants you to give you comfort right away, God can do that. If God knows exactly that that will help you to be more like Christ, he will do that. God knows that you can, by giving you a new job, a position, then he would give you. Because my, it would help my son to be more and more like Christ. If that relationship would jeopardize your relationship with God, and it would help you to be more like Christ, God won't give you that. And God would, you, would pull you out from that relationship. God will pull you out from that business. Because God is he's omniscient. He's, we only see the... The, the immediate. We only see the, the present. We only see, we are all nearsighted. But God sees the future. God sees the eternal. The past, present, and future. We only see things in front of us. God sees already the result. But the point is, He's doing something in your life. You're going through the process. If, it God, if God is at work, it must be good. God will never go wrong. If God is at work, it must be for his glory and for your good. Remember that. I don't know your situation. I don't know your circumstances at the moment. But what I'm sure of, God is at work in your life. And he's sanctifying you, separating you from the world in order for you to become more and more like Christ. Praise God. That's the first point that I would like to share to you. Because God is at work. Remember that you are being prepared. Wow. God is at work in my life. And God is preparing me for the coming of my Lord Jesus Christ. When would Jesus come? We don't know. Maybe tonight. Maybe right now. Can you hear the trumpet? I hope not. Maybe this afternoon, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. We don't know, but we are being ready by God for that day, for that moment, for that hour. That's why we are being prepared always in our lives. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have to be ready with our spirit. Soul and body. Human beings, people, men, women, we are, what do you call that? We are composed of th three parts, okay? To put it this way, to put it simply, spirit, soul, and body, okay? Every human being has a spirit, soul, body, okay? So in order for you to understand this clearly, all right, we have our spirit, we have our soul, 
with a buddy. All right? We have our spirit. We have our soul, our body. In Genesis 2, 7, God said, when God formed the clay and he breathed on his nostril and it became a living soul. So that living soul has a spirit and has a body. That's Adam. Adam from the clay, God breathed on his nostril and he became a living soul. Of course, we can see Adam or we read about Adam. He had a body, he had a soul, and he had a spirit. What's that spirit, soul, and body, Pastor Jun? Our spirit connects to God and feeds. Oh, I missed. The soul. It's not compatible. I'm using Mac, but uh, my, our PowerPoint, uh, our computer there, thing, so Windows. Can you read that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our spirit connects to God and feeds the soul. And our soul has mind, will, and emotion. All right? Our soul is composed of mind, will, and emotion. Mind is where you think. Will is when you make decisions. Emotion is where you feel. You feel something. That's your emotion. That's your soul. So every human being has a soul because we can think, we can feel, and we can make decisions in life. And our soul is con con connects to the spirit and feeds the body. All right? Do you follow? I hope I'm making myself clear here. Our body connected to the soul. It's, it's, I said connected because you cannot separate soul and body. Because if you separated that, it means death. But as long as we are living, our body is connected to our soul. And that connects us and the body connects us to the world. Right? Adam and Eve has a spirit, had a soul, had a body. He, tend, he tended the, 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 the plants and the animals. He had soul, mind and spirit, mind, emotion and will, and the spirit of God. But when Adam sinned, what happened? When Adam sinned, what happened? What happened? The spirit died. From then on, human beings, they were being driven by their soul, by their own mind, emotion, and will. It's not being influenced or fed by the spirit. Because the spirit is dead. Imagine your mind, emotion, and will are just being fed by the world. Your own mind. Our mind is filthy. Our mind is lost. Emotion, we base our emotion on what we feel and on what we see. Will is what the mind tells us, what the emotion tells us, that's where we make decision, our body. And when we, we, we accepted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, when we accepted Christ, our Lord, what happened to that part? What happened to the spirit? Born again spirit. The spirit came alive. And now, there is now the spirit that would feed again the soul and that would connect to the body, that body would connect to the world. Do you see? Can you follow? That's why you need to connect to God through the spirit that is in you. If you're not going to connect your spirit with God, then what would, what would your soul receive? Nothing. But if your spirit is connected to God, then you are hearing the word of God. Through the word of God, you obey the word of God. You strengthen your faith. You learn about the truth. And the truth will set you free and will help you to feed your soul, your mind, emotion, and will. And when your spirit is connected to God... And you learn from the word of God that 
This is the people that you need to be associated with. To be associated with. You have to learn from them. You have to date. You don't be equally yoked with unbeliever. That's what the word of God tells you. But your emotion says, oh, he's cute. Uh, she's pretty. I want he, her. Oh. But the spirit that's connected to God tells you that that would lead you and that would destroy your life if you're going to engage or make business with that person. No, your mind tells you, I think that's not right. You're trying to oppose what, what the Spirit is telling you. You don't want to obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It starts with that. That's why it says in Romans 12, to renew your, renew, be transformed by renewing up your mind. You have to renew your mind. How can you renew your mind? By reading the Word of God. And you're reading the Word of God, you are When you are, when, when you are, when you're reading the word of God, you're renewing your mind. You're obeying, you're learning, you're putting it into practice. And then your emotion, you would, it would affect your emotion. You will become happy. Right? And then, then you are going to decide. You're going to make right decisions because your mind is fed by the spirit and you have the right emotion. Because your mind is right. If you, you cannot control your emotion. But if, you, if you're going to control your emotion, it's very hard. But if you can control your mind, then you can control your emotion. What you feed your mind will help you to, 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 to you, have, you will have to feel right. You will you feel right. And because of that, you will going to make a right decision. And it will affect your body. Because your body would connect to the world. The way you're going to engage with people. The way you're going to answer your mom, your dad, it would depend how your soul, uh, the, the state of your soul. If your soul is not being fed by the spirit, if you're not connected with the spirit, then I don't know how you're going to engage with people. Do you, do you get what I'm saying here? <laughs> don't be surprised if you're with your actions. Don't be surprised the way you engage, the way you answer. The way you live your life, the way, the way you treat others, the way you treat your body, the way you serve people. Don't be surprised if you're doing wrong, if you're disobeying your parents, if you're disobeying the authorities, if you're cheating. Don't be surprised because naturally our soul is not born again. Only the spirit has been born again. You know what? We are a new creation. The, new in, the newness of our spirit is very evident when we became born again. But our soul is the same. If you're stupid before, you're still stupid today. Your body is still the same. You're fat today. You're still, you're, if you're fat last year, you're still fat today. Only the spirit has been born again. But if you want to, if you want to become skinny, then you have to... You have to, you have to What's your diet? What I'm trying here, I'm trying to say here, what, the, what, what was born again is our spirit, not your soul and not your body. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation, the old has gone and the new has come. But your old body is still there. Your soul, your mind is still there. That's why Romans 12 2 said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to renew your mind daily by connecting to the spirit, by reading the word of God. When you read the word of God, you obey it, you are being sanctified. You are being changed from glory to glory. You are being, becoming more and more like Christ. You are going through the process by reading the word of God, praying, connecting to God, and then you have a right mind, right will, and right emotion, and it reflects your actions. And when you act, when you speak, when you talk, when you, when you perform things, you are reflecting the character of God, the image and likeness of God being manifested through your actions, through your speech, and through your thoughts. Because you are connected to God. And your soul, your mind, will and emotion is rightly corrected to the spirit. And it feeds your body and your body connects to the world, to your office mate, to your classmates, to your bosses, to your managers. To your family, to your mom, to your dad, to 
your siblings. So how do you engage with people? How do you treat people? How do you answer people? How do you work at your workplace? That's the direct result of your connection to the Spirit. If you are impatient, then you are not connected to the Spirit. You are disobeying the Spirit. If you are unloving, then you are not connected. Yes, you are connected, but you are trying to, to, to stop it. Not follow. It's, the soul is like a valve. But if you can open and you can open or close it. The Spirit is flowing through you so that your body could perform what is holy, morally right, righteous. But if your soul is shut, not trying to get something from the Spirit and flow through your body, then your actions would be negative, bad. You know what I'm saying here? So it's so important for us. To read the word of God, to pray, connect to God because it is always available. Our Wi-Fi with God is always available. It's just for us to allow that impression of the Holy Spirit to, to bless us, to work on our mind, to renew our mind so that it could affect our emotion and will. So now, I hope that this is clear to you right now. What is spirit, soul, and body? If you are a born-again Christian, then your spirit is alive. And it should be, it is connected to God, but it's up to your soul, your mind, will, and emotion. If you accept that spirit's prompting, then it would feed your body so that your actions would be congruent to what spirit tells us to do. Oh, and then, last point that I would like to share, but definitely not the last slide. Remember that you are called by a faithful God. You're going through some tough times. You are sick. You are diagnosed with sickness. You lose your job. You are abandoned by your friends or even your family. You're battling depression. You're battling your friends physically. Remember that you are called by God, by a faithful God. Because God is going, you're going through the process. Because God is preparing you. God is making you to become more and more like Christ. And God is faithful. To be a good dad is your calling. To be a good, if you're a mom, your calling is to be the best mom ever. If you're a husband, you have a calling to be the best husband. If you are a wife, you have a calling to be the best wife. If you're a brother or a sister, you have a calling to be a good brother or sister. If you are a businessman or woman, you have a calling to be the best or good businessman or businesswoman. If you're an employee, you have, a, you have a calling to be a good employee. If you are a teacher, a pastor, a leader, a life group leader, that's your calling. And God is faithful. The one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. If you are going to connect to God through the Spirit, and let the Spirit influence your emotions, your will, emotion, and mind. So that when you engage with your husband, you will love your husband as the Word of God commanded us. And you as a husband, when you're connected to the Spirit, your mind, will, and emotion would reflect, th th that would reflect your actions. Then you would go into submit to your husband. And if you are children, then you would, just, you would obey your mom and dad if you are connected to the Spirit because you are influenced by the Spirit. Your mind, soul, and, and emotion would be manifested through your actions by obeying your, your mom and dad. 
and authorities, and even you as father, you would be teaching, loving, caring for your children because that's what the Bible tells you. You may not see the fruit right now. I'm loving my husband, Pastor Jun, but he's not, I, I'm loving my wife, Pastor Jun, but, but she's not submitting to me. It's okay. It's fine. God will do it. Just do your part and God will do it because he called you to be a good husband. I'm submitting to my husband, Pastor Jun, but he's not loving me. It's okay. You're going through the process. The one who calls you to be a good wife will do it. Not you, but God will do it. I'm obeying my parents, Pastor June, but they're still the same. They don't understand me. I feel rejected. I feel abandoned. Keep obeying your parents. Let God deal with your parents. Because the God who calls you to be the good, to be the best son or daughter, will do it. I don't know when, don't ask me. But certainly God will do it. I'm, so, I'm a hardworking person, Pastor Jim, but the... the my boss is still mean to me. The company is not giving me promotion, Pastor Jun. God knows your work. God knows when to promote you. Do you think God is a dumb God? He doesn't know when to promote you, to give you a, ri a pay rise, to give you a new job? Come on. He is faithful. He will do it. In his perfect time. You can't do it by yourself. But God can do it. He will do it. And this tells me that our salvation is secure. You cannot so lose your salvation. Because he who began a good work in you is faithful. If you can lose your salvation because of your petty sins. Because your disobedience. Because of this sin that you have committed. If you think that you could lose your salvation. That you could go to hell because you have sinned. After you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, what? Are we serving an unfaithful God? It declares here that He is faithful. The one who calls you is faithful. If you would lose your salvation, we might change this to the one who calls you is unfaithful. He cannot deliver you from sin. He cannot deliver you from evil. He cannot do it. But the word is explicit here that He is faithful. You cannot lose your salvation. If you are truly born again Christian, you cannot lose your salvation. Because your salvation doesn't depend on your merit. It doesn't depend on your works. It doesn't depend on your goodness. It doesn't depend on your tithes and offerings or your service. It doesn't depend there. It's de it depends on the grace of God that God bestowed upon you. And he's faithful to complete it. He already began a good work in you. He's not a, a weak God who would stop caring for you, loving for you because you are stubborn or disobedient. I would abandon my children because they just sometimes disobey me. I would continue to love them. It doesn't change the fact that they are still my children even though they rebel, they, they, they slammed the door on me and they go, went out and forever leave me, leave from my presence. They are still my children. The same way with God. Even you sin, even you, you, see, you abandon God, abandon the church, if you're truly a born-again believer, there would come a point that you would come back to him because you are a child of God. You can, you, can, you can mess up with your fellowship with God, with your communion with God, but your relationship with God cannot be altered. It will be forever the same. You are a child of God. No one could alter that. Remember that you are called by God who is faithful. It says there in 1 Corinthians 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. It is common, your temptation, your trials in life. Come on. We are all experiencing all these things. We are all, we are all experiencing these things. It's just a matter of time with different seasons in life. 
But the God is faithful. If you're going through some temptation right now, temptation or trials in life, He will not let you be tempted or tried beyond what you can bear. He cannot leave you alone. But if you're tempted for some reason, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So how, that's how faithful our God is. Wow. Where can you run away from God? He's so faithful. He's there for you always. He will do it. And the next one is let's say, for Second Thessalonians 3.3. 3, it says, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Evil is always present, but God is faithful to you. Evil at work, evil at home, evil at while driving or what have you, God is able to protect you because He is faithful. You may be unfaithful right now. You may be faithless right now, but God is faithful. He will always be the same. He who began a good work in you. If you are a born-again Christian, God already began a good work in you. And he will not abandon you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is not cheap. That's the blood of Jesus that shed, that covered all your sins. No amount of sins could destroy your relationship with God. Might destroy your fellowship, but not your relationship as a child of God. Because He is faithful to complete it. And then, the last three verses of Paul in 1 Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. This tells us that Paul needs prayer. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They needed prayer, and we all need prayer. We need to pray for one another. Verse 26 tells us, greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I'm not saying that we kiss one another here, but some culture, they kiss one another in cheek or even lips or beso beso or what have you. If it's not your culture, don't do it. But what this verse tells us is we have to be in fellowship with one another. Remember, the culture during that time is in this church, there are Jewish and Gentiles. They are perennial rivals, perennial enemies. They don't, they don't agree with one another. They even fight and kill one another during the time. But then they became born again. And when they're inspired by the Spirit, their mind, will, and emotion, their soul changed, renewed, and their actions toward one another also change. That's why they can give a holy kiss. It is common to them during the time, the, the, the Gentiles, the Greeks, Romans, it's common to them to greet with a holy kiss. That's why Paul encouraged them to have a holy kiss. Imagine your enemy, you're going to kiss them. Not only that, in that church, there are masters and servants, slaves. But when they were born again, their soul changed. Their mind, will, and emotion changed. That's why their actions, their speech, their thoughts changed as well. And they learn to submit to one another. Masters kissing the slaves. How could it be? It's because of the spirit that is alive in them. That changed their soul, their mind, will and emotion. That reflects in their actions. And now they could see the character of God. The love of God. That's being expressed to people. Verse 27, I charge you before the Lord to have this letter, this letter, this letter of 1 Thessalonians. Read to all brothers and sisters. That's the point. Paul wanted this church to read the Word of God. Because it's only through the Word of God that we'll be able to see and experience the power of God through His Word. And he ended it, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Grace is unmerited favor. You cannot earn it. It is free gift. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be 
with you. God is at work in you. Can we all stand, church? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be going through some tough times right now. You cannot understand what happened to your life, to your relationship, to your job, to your, to your health, to your business, to your transactions. You don't, you can't understand. Remember, God is at work in you. You're going through the process. God already knew the end result. You're going through the process. And you are being prepared. Daily, you are being prepared to face your boss, to face your manager, to face people, to engage with them. And by having a right connection with the Spirit, your soul will be ready and your body is fed and influenced by your soul. Praise God. You are called by a faithful God. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. I don't know what's in your mind right now. I don't know what you're waiting. I don't know. But God will do it. God will do it. Why? Why? Because He is faithful. You think your soul right now, your mind, will, emotions are not right with God. Maybe your spirit is still dead. You need to be born again right now. So that your mind, will, and emotion will be renewed daily to be more and more like Christ. That's the first step. If that's you, wherever you are, if you want to have a right relationship, connection with God, you need to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Wherever you are, just raise your hand. If that's you, don't be shy. If that's you. So, I guess all of us here have already personal relationship with God and now what we can do is thank you for that hand brother thank you for the decision and just pray this prayer with me brother just repeat this prayer after me Jesus I come to you with humility I have seen against you and against people. But thank you that you died for all my sins. And because of that, I can live freedom. And right now, I accept you into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Quicken my spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, brother, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you right now. And you have now the capacity to connect with God through His Word, through prayer. And you will have a right mind, will, and emotion. And you will start to live a life that is pleasing to God through your actions. And may God help you to live the kind of life that you would like you to live, Him to you to live. May you be blessed. May you be empowered. May you experience the newness in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray to each and every person in this room who's having trouble, oh God, 
to connect with their spirit because they are living in flesh. They want to satisfy their mind, will, and emotion. They're being driven by the world. The world is dictating us and not the spirit that dictates us. Holy Spirit right now. Empower us. Help us, Lord, to accept and receive the prompting of the Holy Spirit and not to oppose it, not to reject it, but to believe and receive it that we may be able to act according to your word, according to the leading of the Spirit, that we may be able to love our children, to be able to love my spouse, to be able to love my, my, my friends, to be able to love my neighbors, to be able to love my workmates, my classmates. God, help us because this is what you have called us to do. Holy Spirit, have your way right now. We cannot do it by our own selves because our mind is polluted. Lord, our emotion is tricky. Sometimes we are up, sometimes we are down. We cannot trust our emotions. Oh God, help us, Lord, to be driven by our spirit. Thank you, Lord, that I can sense in my spirit right now that you're renewing the minds of your people, that we could live freely, that we could start loving people, serving you, start serving people by the power of the Spirit that is at work in us. This is your church. This is your body. Have your way, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. God bless you, church. See you next Sunday. Invite your friends.